Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today at this special online family event from Science World. My name is Brian. I'm one of the curators here at Science World in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, we're delighted that so many of you could join us. If you're in the chat there and feel comfortable, feel free to let us know where you're joining from. We always like to know where people are visiting from. Uh, we will have our technician, Madeline, monitoring the chat today. If there's any technical issues, if you're not able to see or hear at any point, let us know and we can sometimes make adjustments to help with that. This event today is in connection with our Backyard Adventures feature exhibition happening at Science World, where we encourage people to be scientists in your own backyard. And a backyard can be all manner of things. Uh, I live in an apartment building myself. We don't have a backyard. I have parks, I have paths. Uh, walking around Science World down the seawall here, there's a wonderful island called Habitat Island that you can only visit at certain times of day because the tide will cover it up. Uh, I would like to begin by also acknowledging Science World is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. And we are very grateful for the opportunity to live, work, and play on these lands. Uh, today, we are looking at stories that the seasons can tell us and from an indigenous way of knowing. We're very grateful and privileged to have with us today our special guest, uh, Dion Paul, who is the Indigenous Arts and Culture Planner for the City of Vancouver, uh, as well as quite a celebrated artist in our community. So welcome, Dion. Hi, thank you. Good day, everyone. My name is Chemik, and I'm also known as Dion. I come from the Nuhalk Nation, which is in Balakula, and the Shishoth Nation, where I'm zooming in from, here in the Seashell Territory. It's nice to be here. So I am an artist. I'm a painter, weaver, sculptor. I have a master's from Emily Carr and I'm also a plant medicine woman. And I'm gonna take you through a little journey of all the months um, through a typical year uh, in my life and how um, the land and the ocean and the environment around us um, impacts and influences my art practice and my plant medicine practice. So I put this presentation together with some language components and I've asked my dear friend and cousin from the Seashelt Nation who is an anthropologist, traditional knowledge keeper, she's a language speaker and she runs Talese Tours out of Vancouver, an Indigenous ecotourism where they do plant medicine walks and snowshoeing and I'd like to introduce Candy. Khatsameitsa. All noms chemic e to quail utmesiaia, cache one tin. Amosh, Amosh. Good afternoon, everybody. My ancestral name is Hasameza. I'm really happy to be amongst friends today. I thank you, Chemik, for inviting me to be a part of your presentation. I'm very excited to see your art presentation. All noms chalak. All noms. Okay, so let's get into it. We've got a lot to get through, so I'll try to get through as much as we can to open up for questions at the end. So our word for season is? Si lao no. Si, si lao no. And our word for spring? Tempaea. Tempaea. So I'm also learning some of our languages we go, and that's why I've asked Candy to be here. Um, our traditional languages were actually banned uh, at one time by the Canadian government. So a lot of us don't speak it, but we are all in the process of learning, and it feels good in my heart to speak these words. Thank you, Candy. So in our um, culture, we don't have months. That's not how we view the world. Um, that is a very European settler concept, but we've adapted to it so that it um, sort of flows together and makes sense. And from our perspective, the month of March is what we consider when the salmon berry shoots arrive. This is my favorite snack in the whole forest. Tim Saltsky shell shell. Ten satskai shal shal. So the word shal shal is actually moon. So uh, salmonberry shoots moon. So we're going to go by the um, lunar um, cycle. 
So in the springtime, salmonberry shoots come out and this is my dad and he introduced me to plant medicine picking at an early age. And this was one of the very first plant medicines that I picked. And this is very, very special because this only comes out for maybe two weeks of the year. So when you hear like little rumors around the reserve that the salmonberry shoots are out, the sauce guy's out, you like run out into the forest because you only have two weeks. So you'll see this burgundy um, outer shell on the uh, salmonberry berry and it's kind of prickly but when you pick it you can like peel it off and on the inside is like a sweet celery it's so delicious so the month of april we recognize as grizzly when the grizzly bear and the black bear appear tim mayok shell show a tim stitwin shell shell we know the bear to be our teacher Tem Mayuk Shal Shal, Tem Shitwen Shal Shal. So in our culture, the bear has a very, very strong medicine and we can render the fat from the bear and we use it, um, you can rub it on your hair. It makes your hair super shiny. You can rub it on your skin for dried cracked skin. You can also rub it on your moccasins. It'll make them waterproof um, and bear, uh, we consider the bear to be a protective medicine. So when you wear the bear oil, um, it's believed that we are protected. So in the top uh, left picture, you can see me actually in a bear den. I was with C. Swise from the Squamish Nation doing some conservatory work. And you can see the process of me cutting the fat and then you render it slowly and then you see the bear grease at the end. And we can mix this also with a pigment for sacred paint. So the month of May is when we recognize osprey nesting and sea onion are ripe. Tim still, still. And I wanted to share that sea onion is a squall match. Oh, um, yes. I was wondering about that. I, I remember picking that with my dad as well. Um, so squall match. And that, I think that comes a little bit later in the summer, right? sorry, in May. So during this time is also when the um, sap on the cedar tree is running. Um, the cedar tree to our people is the tree of life. We build our homes with it, build canoes with it. We make utensils. You can, in the springtime when the sap is running, you can actually pull the bark off the tree and we make um, clothing, mats, hats with it. Um, and it's also a very special time of the year because it's got a short window. So when the sap is running, you have to go. So so these are some of my children. I've taken people out and taught them how to um, strip cedar. So we are taught that you only strip one fourth of the tree and that you have to strip it on the north side. And the reason why we strip it on the north side is that it doesn't get any sun damage. So this won't kill the tree. The tree will heal itself. That's the reason why we only take one fourth of the tree. And you can see images of me taking that outer bark and processing it down into strips. And these strips will be made into hats and mats and baskets. Um, here are some images of um, some hats, a hat that I made. So there are different types of hats. There are winter hats that are um, you can seal to keep the rain out. And then there's summer hats that are a little bit more open and airy. The basket on the bottom left is a clam basket. So you actually put that basket in the water and then when you gather your clams, you put them in there and the water can run through and it keeps the clams fresh while you're harvesting. The black basket on the bottom is actually from our wild woman. So we have legends of a wild woman in the woods who steals children. And she's known to wear a basket on her back. And I wanted to create one to honor her and to honor her story. And in my mom's language in Nukhalk, um, we know her as Snenik. And I actually added horse hair onto it to further honor her. Just wanted to share that wild woman here um, amongst the Skoomish is Kakali. And our next, yes. Thank you. Our next season is Tim Eos. Tim Eos, summer. So we recognize the month of June as salmon berries are ripe moon. So I wanted to reiterate that the shal shal is the moon. So we're talking about different moons, not actually the month. And 
Kim Quil Quil Shell Shell translates the berry that holds the water. It also cleanses you. Oh, that's so beautiful. Tim Quil Quil Shell Shell. So Quil Quil is the berry in the middle. And that and you said it's the berry that holds water? Yes. Oh, that's so beautiful. So this is a time when everyone gets excited to go out berry picking. Those are my children on the right. We pick um, blackberries, thimbleberries. Um, there's um, some huckleberries. There's special um, blue huckleberries and the blue huckleberries are at high elevation. So you have to hike way up to get those. Thimbleberries, currants. What other berries did we pick, Candy? Black caps and salel. Oh, yes. So also during this time is when I get started on some of my cedar work. So I had this um, 14 foot red cedar log that I had milled and I my intention with it was to make two carved doors. But when my dad and my brother were moving it from the ground up onto the truck, I saw a table and I was like, oh, you want to be a table? You don't want to be a door. So when I actually took this tree down, the first 12 feet of it were uh, I carved a totem with my father and my ex-husband. And I promised this tree that I would do everything in my power to make beautiful things out of it, that I wouldn't um, let any of it go to waste, that this tree's life is sacred, and meaningful. And it, this table took me about a year to carve. There's no one on the coast or anyone that I know that's working in resin in this way. So I was teaching myself this process as I went. And when I, I cut the design out and then I filled it with river rock and then resin, and I got to play with a blowtorch, by the end of it, I needed like four men to help me move it. It, it was becoming um, so heavy and so huge. So this is the final product. And this is a Coast Salish um, uh, moon design. And it's also like reflective of our joints. So like our elbows, you'll see a lot of like in um, animals or creations, you'll see this design where it reflects the joints of um, the human body, the anatomy of animals. And it's also reflective of the moon. So I put um, river rock in it and filled it with cedar. It's 14 feet long and can seat up to 11 people. And because that project was so heavy, I didn't want to, it was getting um, a little uncomfortable, always asking for like three or four men to help me move it or flip it every time. So I um, started taking my large cedar slabs and cutting them down further. I ordered these molds and I'm making charcuterie boards. So I've got stacks and stacks of um, boards that I can make and pour resin into them. So here's an example of some of the jewelry boards that I made. I had a solo art exhibition down at Gibson's Public Art Gallery, and I got to showcase these. <clears throat> so in the previous photo, you can see where the cedar was inlaid, and then I pour resin into it. And in some of them, I've added um, cedar or um, stinging nettle. I've added clamshells to add a further um, connection to the land. So it's like the plant medicine, it's art, um, together and then it's going to be meant to be used in the kitchen. Um, feasting is huge in our culture so it was um, an extra layer to make um, feast platters. The month of July is when the red elderberries are ripe. Tem stich shall shall. Tem stich shall shall. So Candy and I were having a discussion about um, red elderberries, if they were poisonous or not. And we thought that they were. And I actually looked it up and red elderberries are poisonous. Um, but it was saying in all the um, descriptions that Indigenous people ate them. So it kind of is kind of confusing um, to eat a berry that's um, poisonous. But the Indigenous people, our people, use them. We knew that it would make you sick. So if you had eaten some other kind of poison, you could eat red elderberries and it would take the toxins out of you. So we used it as a purgative. So it's taking that um, element from the plant medicine and using it to our advantage. During this time is a, a beautiful time when the forest comes alive and there's so many secrets in the forest and there's so many, like the forest tells you um, 
clues to what it can be used for. So like if you look at a mullein leaf, it's very fuzzy on the outside, like the inside of the lungs. So it tells us that it's good for lung medicine. The top left is one of our most powerful and sacred plant medicines. It's the uh, Devil's Club and it uh, comes out in the spring. We use the bark and I've recently started using the um, leaves. It's good for bronchitis. It helps with um, joint pain. We used it in diaper rash. We made paint out of it. You can hang hang it on the wall and the prickles, uh, the prickles of this um, plant are believed to be so powerful that they ward off evil spirits. So I hang some above my doorway so no evil spirits can come into my house. Uh, in the top right you can see one of my mm -hmm cauldrons. I make a plant medicine that is one of my most powerful and it takes me about four days to make. So in my um, pot, I simmer tree sap for about a day and then I add bark and roots to it and simmer it for another day and then berries and leaves for another day and the last to go in are flowers and then that's strained out and that is um, drunk as a tea. Um, uh, Chief Rhonda Sandoval from Nahalk Nation taught me how to make this and she actually taught me how to can it. So I know how to can tea medicine. Um, I take my kids clam, clam, clamming is one of our favorites and the bottom left is a cockle and a cockle clam is like, it's like finding a gem, like a diamond in the rough. Like you, when you find a cockle, it's like, yay. I remember going clam digging with my parents as kids and they would um, put a start a fire at the beach. And when we get a clam, we'd run up and put it close by the fire. So it was like a little ring all around the fire and your little clam would cook. And then you turn it over and cook the other side and then crack it open and eat it. Um, so I took my kids uh, harvesting clams this past summer and the clam shells I actually inserted into the uh, charcuterie boards that I was making. So it's taking um, our cultural practice of uh, food harvesting, reinventing it into a feast platter that's used for food. So it's connecting our culture, um, like our desires, our needs into a useful artistic utensil. I was so happy to do this. So August we recognize as when the salal berries are ripe. Temtaka shell shell. Temtaka shell shell. Wanted to share that this berry was so vital because it has nat natural pectin and it has immense vitamins, vitamin C's, antioxidants, but it was the primary berry that binded the berries together that allowed us to make delicious, super berry leather and dehydrated berry cakes. Amazing. The salal leaves are also, if you boil them, just the salal leaves by themselves and you can gargle it and that'll help with any canker sores that um, the person has. So once I harvest the medicine, I also have a pretty um, long and lengthy teaching practice. So I teach uh, plant medicines, how to make teas, how to make salves, how to make um, all kinds of medicines. So when I was taught about plant medicines, um, Chief Rhonda Sandoval from Bella Kula said to me, this is a huge responsibility to carry this knowledge of plant medicines and one of one of the teachings is now that you carry it, if anyone ever asks for a remedy, you have to give it. You cannot withhold. So whenever anyone, if I'm like not even in their town and they've asked for it, I'll make it and drive it to them. Like it's it's a pretty big responsibility to, to carry this. So I love teaching groups, teaching high school kids and elementary schools. And there's the Taha down here. During this time, I also teach um, moccasin making. So um, I do a beading class first and then a moccasin making. I'm actually doing a moccasin making uh, workshop this weekend with our nation. I also teach drum making. So I've taught, I've been teaching drum making for about, I'd say 26 years. And I've taught um, elementary, high school, rites of passage. The top left is the burlesque troupe um, from Vancouver, uh, Virago Nation. I've taught um, for baby welcoming and I absolutely love teaching drum making. 
And um, when I was younger, my dad was trying to teach me how to cure hides the traditional way. And you have, actually have to use part of the brain from the deer with the hide. And when I was a teenager, I could not handle the, the smell. Of it, so I just never learned it. But now that I'm like a hunter now, I'm going to be skinning it. I'm actually going to be coming full circle to learn the tanning process. So fall. Tim Palamea, and it translates when the leaves are falling. Oh, Tim Palamea, when the leaves are falling. That's so beautiful. So September is the moon that we recognize when salmon, sockeye salmon are spawning. Tim sockeye shell shell. Tim sockeye shell shell. So when the salmon start coming, Candy and I know that uh, everything stops. People take days off work, they leave school, everyone rushes home to help process the salmon. And usually there's like a, like a um, industry line of people, someone's cutting, someone's filling, someone's got the jars, someone's watching. And on the right um, is how we do um, traditional open pit salmon. And my dad's carved some of the steaks for me and we put um, the salmon through and it's so delicious. It's got like that smoky flavor. And I think with um, over harvesting and environmental changes, the volume of salmon that we see coming in is dwindling and dwindling, which is pretty concerning. So when I get to, like we used to have like tons and tons of canned salmon and are like, I get like a case or two now and it's like gold. Mm -hmm. Around this time uh, is also when the mushrooms come out and people often think of mushrooms as food, different types of food that you can eat if you know about mycology. And I started this journey um, last year and I went out with some mycologists on the coast harvesting mushrooms, but not only for um, food, but um, as a dye product. So this is where like the artistic um, person in me comes out and I'm like looking at all these mushrooms and I'm like, what color would it be? So in the middle photo, you see me actually going down to one of our sacred um, pools. It's a cold water spring. And I wanted to see what color um, these mushrooms would um, bring with the um, pH balance of a natural spring. So there'd be a different pH balance from tap water, from lake water, from ocean water, and from a natural spring. So I was playing with different types of mushroom and different types of pH balance. And the bottom right is um, the, the yarn that I was dyeing, and my intention is to weave them into tiny earrings. So these are a series of earrings that I made. They're meant to be like tiny blankets. I've been weaving for about 26 years, both wool and cedar. And I went through a couple of years where I was weaving a lot of earrings. The intention with the yarn being dyed with mushrooms, um, it was like the mushrooms will be like whispering little secrets of the forest into your ears when you're wearing them. So the month of October is when we recognize the chum salmon are on their main run. Tim Siyank, shell shell. Tim Siyank, shell shell. I didn't have any pictures of salmon, but, um, or sorry, chum salmon, but I wanted to share these pictures. So these are when the um, snowberries come out. And when, when I was talking earlier about nature giving us clues of what um, these plant medicines are good for or can be used for, if you look at this little white berry, it kind of looks like little warts. And that's exactly what they're good for. So the little um, white berries uh, we use um, to to deal with any warts on the body or discoloration. So when my kids would have warts, I would put pick some of these berries and put them in their pockets. And whenever they put their hands in their pockets, I said, just rub, rub it on the berries. And I'd say within a week, three days to a week, the warts are gone. We also pick, sorry, did you want to say something, Candy? I said my grandmother treated me with the snowberry as well and got rid of my warts for me when I was a little girl and my social life resumed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When my, I had warts too, I had them really bad on my left hand. And my mom said, when you rub them on there, you have to whisper to the warts and tell them it's time to go. So you give them permission to leave. Yeah. And you see in the bouquet, there is... Um, 
rose hips and juniper berries. Um, so rose hips, you pick the rose hips just before the first frost. And rose hips is very high in vitamin C. Um, I add it to teas, it dries beautifully. And also around this time is when we start to go hunting. So the bucks are getting going into rut and they say when the bucks are going into rut, they kind of go crazy and they, they aren't paying attention to um, their surroundings as much as the, they're trying to find the does. So this was um, my second year hunting. I shot my first deer this year. And the two boys in the photo are my oldest son, Shale. He's 25 and my youngest son, Nukal. Nukal actually shot a buck this year too. Around this time, again, I do more plant medicine uh, workshops. So these are some images of salves that I make. So salves are like creams that you put on your body. Some can be for sore muscles and aches and pains, arthritis, and then some can be for skin rashes. So depending on the affliction that the person has um, will dictate what plant medicines I will put in my salves. The um, leaves, the big green leaves, uh, the top left, the tiny green leaves are Labrador tea. And we pick that and drink it. It's one of our most flavorful and um, sought after medicines. The big, large leaves are Devil's Club. And I was cutting those down into um, to add to bath salts. And the top right corner is also that um, strong medicine. It's got a uh, root medicine, leaf medicine, berry medicine, bark medicine, lichen medicine. So a variety of different medicines depending on um, what you're trying to teach. So this, the bottom right is a class that I taught last year. In the winter time, we also get busy on weaving. So the bottom right corner is um, a handful of um, wool that I thigh spun. And I think it took me about a week to thigh spin that one little ball. Um, so our blankets, when you hear the word um, we're blanketing someone, it means a high honor. And it can take up to five or six years to gather enough mountain goat wool to make a blanket. Um, the women would hike up to where the mountain goats are in the spring and they'd be shedding their fur and they'd gather the, the wool off the um, branches or hunters would go hunt them. And I know that in our nation, only certain families were allowed to hunt the mountain goat. Um, so you would have to pay them and ask permission and ask them to go get a mountain goat. In Balakula, I read that they um, the hunters would find round stones, super round stones, and put them in their pockets and then get a plank of wood. And then they'd hike up to where the mountain goats cross the, the mountain and they'd put those four rocks and the plank over top of it and then cover it with moss. And then when the mountain goat would come, it would slip and they would fall. And that's how they would hunt the mountain goat. So I've been weaving for about 26 years. Um, my first year of weaving, I spent spinning. I spent carding and spinning and dyeing. I didn't even see a loom the first year. Um, I weave uh, blankets, mats, hats, um, bags. I've, I've woven copper. I've woven fiber optic lights into it. Um, in the top left is my daughter and I was teaching a class on how to make regalia for a rites of passage ceremony. I also build the looms that you see. So our month of November is known as the coho, when the coho salmon are spawning. I do want to share a really fun story. My ancestral name is Hatsumeitsa and my mentor, um, Donna, she mistakenly called me Kamaitsa, which is Tim Kamaitsa, Shell Shell, the season of the coho. So I've inherited another name and I, they also call me Coho Candy. <laughs> oh, good one. I didn't know that. Can you say it again? Kamaietsa. Kamaietsa. Kamaietsa shal shal. So the coho salmon moon. So during this time is when we go into our big houses and there's lots of singing and drumming. And I wanted to add that our culture has games and toys. We made all different kinds of toys. And this is one of our one of my most favorite games. It's called Slahal or Lahal or Bone Game or Stick Game, the gambling game. It's one of our oldest games. It's played from Alaska down to California and it's been played for since time immemorial and they're singing and drumming and guessing people bet things on it 
And like, no matter where I teach, I've taught thousands of people this game and everyone catches on and loves it. And there's, uh, we have great fun with it. So it was played if there were two families that had a feud that they couldn't um, come to an agreement, they would play Slahal and whoever won Slahal won that agreement. Sometimes nations would do that. Um, and the Canadian government also banned this game as well. And it went underground. <clears throat> and from what I heard, our people um, would go to um, farms and uh, picking hops, picking corn picking berries and when they were way out in the fields at these hop fields they would play slahal so this game was uh kept going through the generations underground i think it would be um during this time anyone caught playing this could have been arrested and put in jail so i'm very grateful for our ancestors that risked it to keep our singing drumming our games our culture alive so that we can enjoy it today here are some images of me working and building. Um, I love to go to museums and see our artifacts. I was researching a Nihalk blanket that's in a, a museum. It's both bittersweet when I go there. It's like I'm amazed to see the masters at work because I feel like a little grasshopper and I get to see what um, our masters made. And then I also get sad when I look at those masks and those blankets and the artifacts. I wonder what songs they had, what dances they had, who owned them and have they? do they miss dancing? What kind of it's bittersweet for me in that in that sense. Winter. Tim Sotech. Tim Sotech. What does that translate to? It's just with the snow falling. Oh, with the snow falling. Yes. So the month of December is what we recognize as when the ravens are gathering to feed moon. Temsquato shall shall. Temsquato shall shall. So the raven is a trickster. Um, there's lots of stories in every um, nation around that talks about the raven as a trickster. My dad's name is Kwahula, and that means um, white raven before he came became black. So like in our culture, um, some of us have stories about uh, raven when he was white and his mischievous adventures um, burned something down and turned black again. So. My father is named after a white raven before he turned black. I added this image to show you the jarring process. So the tea that I make that takes about four days can actually jar it. And once you keep it in the fridge, I think it'll last up to four to six weeks. So I make um, plant medicine remedies all winter long. So the month of January is known as when bald eagles are gathering to feed. Tim, I shell shell tim kike shell shell um i am from the eagle clan and i was gifted uh three eagles two hawks two ravens and two owls uh, a few years ago and they filled up my freezer and i i put them in the freezer and i thought okay i i will process them at another time i can't get to it right now but then our fisheries department was coming around with halibut and salmon and um, prawns and I didn't want to say no to the halibut and prawns so I pulled out some of the I pulled out an eagle from my freezer so that the halibut and salmon could fit but then I had to process it and um, from my culture the way my mom talks about the eagle it's our totem it's like when we when I specifically see an eagle flying overhead it's believed that it's one of our ancestors coming back to visit me to tell me that I'm being guided to tell me that I'm being protected. Um, where I live, I have um, a husband and wife eagle that live in a tree just outside. Um, they circle above. Anytime I see an eagle, I just feel like blanketed with love and protection. So when I had to process an eagle, it was so um, emotional. I was like shocked and like almost out of my element. Um, and then uh, a friend of mine, her name is Jenny, um, 
from the Northwest coast. She processes um, Canadian geese and she had videos and it, she was like plucking away. And I was like, okay, if Jenny can do it, I can do it. So I started to process and took the wing off the left wing and then the right wing. And what I really wanted was the tail. So this is the tail of the eagle. And I wanted to process it because you can see on the far left, uh, I made a fan out of it. So in some of our sacred ceremonies, um, we use a fan and it's a particularly the peyote ceremony that I was making this for. So that was my intent. Um, I, I got partway through processing the eagle and I actually had to call my dad. I was like, dad, I can't do it. And my dad's a hunter and he's like, you know, used to butchering animals. So he came down and helped me finish it. And I, I still have um, two eagles, two hawks and two ravens in my freezer because I haven't um, taken them out to process them. <laughs> So the month of February, we recognize, is when the loons first appear on the coast. Temskakiam shell shell. Temskakiam shell shell. So I wanted to go into my art practice now. We're circling back um, the February moon. Chief Ian Campbell told me that this moon is the moon that wakes up the frogs. And then the frogs wake up and they wake up with their songs. They start to sing and their songs start to wake up the forest. And I never forgot that when he told me that. I thought that was so beautiful. So the February full moon is one of my favorites. So I'm going to go. So I brought you through. Um, the year, through the seasons, through the months, uh, thinking about the water, uh, the forest, working through all the different materials that um, I use in my art practice and my plant medicine practice. And there's stories and songs and teachings that go all along that journey. And I pull them together into art pieces. So these are some paintings and uh, moss wall. So this is a Coast Salish uh, spindle world design I made in moss. The picture in black is um, stones and sinkers and plant medicine bowls balancing. So the, the um, stone on the left is actually a halibut sinker. The one on the bottom is a, a medicine bowl and the four others are sinkers. And this is actually a representation of me balancing my family. So the five stones are my children, the sinker is my ex-husband and I'm in the bottom holding us all. The, there's a painting on the right, and this is actually by, um, I think it's Roy Lichtenstein, and it was uh, the original intent of the painting had to do with suicide and sadness of breaking up, like heartache. And in our culture, we use cold water as a form of purification and ceremony. So I took that concept of her um, in the water as ceremony. She's going to the river to heal herself. The, we believe that the cold water has the power and ability to pull sadness away from us and pull negative energy, bad feelings. So we use the water um, in a purification ceremony. So that's what this uh, painting represents. One on the far right, um, it looks like a candy machine with little candies in it, but it's actually salmon eggs. So those are little salmon eggs. When you put the money in, it comes out and it's like making nostalgic um, that of like when the salmon are running, when we're processing them, when we get to eat them, it's like a treat. Uh, this I made some charcuterie boards. So these were um, not the resin filled, but they're meant to look like the ocean. Both Candy and I grew up like as little seals on the ocean, spending hours and hours swimming and harvesting. Um, so the ocean is very near and dear to us. I don't think I could live uh, away from the ocean. On the right, I made some meditation cushions and they're meant to look like wishing rocks. So my mom told me that a rock that has a um, ring around it um, is a wishing rock. And if you find one, you can throw it back into the ocean and make a wish. But to activate that wish, it can't be for yourself. You have to make a wish for someone else. For a erotica exhibition in Ottawa, I made a moss blanket. So as a plant medicine woman, whenever I'm in the forest and I see a bed of moss, it just looks so delicious to me. I want to climb under it like it's a blanket. And for this exhibition, I thought, what if I can do that? So I went and harvested some live moss and sewed it on a blanket. And then we put it in the gallery and I'm just living my best life there. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I did some pieces for the Year of Reconciliation, and this had to do with residential schools. Um, and I wanted to put this in here to highlight um, the 215 that we just went through and all the discoveries of all the children at the different residential schools all across Canada. So the left is my uh, the wild woman basket on the back of a nun. So I told you earlier that the um, wild woman of the woods was known to steal children. So I took this concept of our legends and put it onto this act of a nun stealing our children and taking them to residential school. The next two pictures are called Her First Day of School and His First Day of School. And these are um, images of um, Indigenous children at the Seashell Nation residential school superimposed onto my children to juxtapose the vast difference of um, first day of school. Um, and it was to highlight that fact that, um, you know, we're not that, we're, I'm only one generation from um, person that went to residential school my dad attended. What about you, Candy? We just missed residential school by by three years, in five years, because it was burnt down in 1975, and you, you were born then, and I was two years old. Did your mom attend? My mother attend, my father and my grandparents, yes. Mm. So we got to go to public school, mm -hmm. and here we are today. Yes. Yeah. And the, the far one was done, it was in 50, or 22 bus stops across Vancouver. And it's a see no evil, hear no evil, say no evil. And that's a kind of a concept that I think is universal. And I wanted to use that universal language to describe um, what had happened. So on the table, um, she's holding her mouth. So speak no language, see no family, hear no culture. And the boy at the back is saying, like, it's a secret. So these discoveries are just coming to light now. You may have seen them in the news. And these are some art pieces that um, I did to, to speak to that. And after my last um, piece, the, the one with the um, he, hear no evil, see no evil. I actually um, couldn't do any more. I was having like nightmares and um, it was like having a physical effect on me. So these are the only pieces that I've done to honor and recognize all the survivors of residential schools. Um, the one on the far right was actually published in a grade eight uh, textbook across Canada. And my niece, uh, who's the um, girl going uh, hear no culture, she was in grade eight the year that this was published. So, so she was in her grade eight textbook. <laughs> Uh, so weaving, I was talking earlier about um, weaving. So I did thigh spinning and it took me six weeks to thigh spin enough just for this headdress. And I researched uh, this blanket. It's um, inspired by a Nahalk blanket in the Museum of Anthropology. And it was for my master's degree thesis. And my master's degree thesis, I studied traditional special effects in potlatch performances. And in this headdress, I actually wove in fiber optic lights and it has a controller in the back and it's um, sound activated. So the fiber optics will um, blink to the beat of a drum. Um, Museum, Museum of Anthropology has this in their permanent collection and that's mink fur that's woven in. Here are some weavings that I've done. So the far left is a pregnant woman on a, um, on a mannequin and the design I wove on a loom, but the belly button and the two, the two nipples on the breast actually match up perfectly. And I, in the middle, I wove a huge loom for a welcome figure for um, Iris Griffith Center. And um, I, I wanted to challenge myself to see if I could weave metal. I wondered if metal could be woven. And it was a fantastic, beautiful experience. I had some leftover strips and I wanted to see if I could weave them with cedar. And that process was tricky because if you get copper wet, it oxidizes and it would leave marks on it. And I didn't want any marks. And cedar, when you're weaving it, you have to keep it wet so that it's, um, pliable and bendy. So it was like almost two elements that were like in direct conflict with each other. And once I um, soaked the cedar, I had to fully keep weaving until it was done. I think it took me nine hours straight to weave it because, because the metal was in it. I couldn't soak the cedar back in to re-wet the um, 
um, cedar. So that one was a little bit tricky and, and fun and more challenge to myself. Here are some pieces I made during my master's degree. It, they were shown at the Bill Reed Gallery. Um, I did a photo shoot on the left that was actually a screen that was hung and I um, shined lights on it. So it was like almost like a silhouette in the back. Um, it was for a um, for instance, erotica show. Um, the bottom right is a mask. So I learned how to do sculpting. Um, and that's actually a foam latex mask that can get glued to the face and it can emote emotions in the way that um, wooden masks can't. So it's a moon mask on the inside and a sun mask on the outside. So it's talking about like the um, evolution of our art and how we um, as artists change materials and are exploring different um, things. It's also about being um, like having the traditional on the outside and having a contemporary feel on the inside and being able to transition back and forth um, between the two worlds. And that's my presentation. Thank you. All notes. That's how you say it in our language. Do you have any was, final words you want to share, Candy? Just wanted to thank you, Chemek. It was really such a treat to be a part of this presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Science World. Thank, thank you. you. It was wonderful just to to hear all the stories, to hear the, uh, the things that happened through the course of the year, the things that people can explore out there. So that was wonderful. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, uh, we don't really have a lot of time here, but feel free to send them through to Science World. I would be happy to forward them along and see what's going on there. Uh, once again, we wanted to thank Audlin Brown for supporting these events as we move forward. Uh, this recording will be available on our YouTube channel if you'd like to hear more of these stories. Myself, I will really want to learn how to play Slahal now. <laughs> I don't think I've ever have game. So thank you both for being part of it. Thank all of you for tuning in and we will see you again. So and if you wanted to reach out to me, you could find me at Domestic Shaman on Instagram and Can Candy Campo has a uh, ecotourism called Talese Tours. People can reach you there. That's fantastic. All right. Thanks everyone. Have so long. <laughs>